please turn your Bibles uh, to Second John. Second John, almost there as you get to the uh, end of your Bible, in between First and Third John. Uh, as you turn there, uh, now kind of a major announcement: uh, we we finished Second John in first service. So we're weaker. I think we can do it again. Okay. So as I was kind of looking at our schedule, I thought, you know, I think uh, what Second John ends very similarly to, to Third John. So we'll say a couple things about the ending of Second John, but look at the some of the things in Second John's ending when we come to the end of Third John in a, in a few weeks. So uh, so so we we did half a book in one Sunday. Record for me. I, I think we can do it again here if the Lord allows in uh, in. A, this uh, second service. As you come here to these verses, you're really dealing with the heart of the epistle, what John wanted to communicate to this church that he loved as he talks about false teachers. And we've been talking about the the unity that exists in a church through love and truth and false teachers represent a threat to that unity. And we'll be talking about that threat to unity and how we respond to that as we look at these verses together together. Uh, Lord willing. So if you're there in Second uh, John, if you'd stand with me in honor of God, if you're able to, to stand, and we'll read these uh, verses together, beginning in uh, verse 7 and making our way to the end of uh, this epistle. And John has just talked about walking in love and you know, being obedient to God's commandments. And then he says this in verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. You may be seated. May our hearts be encouraged through God's word as we read it together this morning and talk about it. Uh, let's, let's pray. Father, we do ask by your grace that our hearts would, would love your truth, and that as we love your truth, we would love one another in truth. And as we do that, we pray that we would know the truth, we'd guard the truth, we'd live the truth, we'd, we'd teach the truth to one another, and that our love would be in in, in, uh, truth as we abide in you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So as we went through 1 John last year, there were several times we talked about false teachers. That was something that John was concerned about in 1 John. We kind of looked a few months ago even at false teachers, and there were some questions that people asked me Kind of two main questions that I really should have seen coming as we talked about false teachers. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, okay, Daniel, I, I heard you give this illustration, and I kind of recognize this person in that illustration. So are you saying definitively that that person is a, a false teacher, and I should put them in my, my false teacher box, and that person is definitely false teacher material? And that was one question. That's understandable that that question would be asked, and the desire for specifics would, would be there. The second question was related to it. It's, okay, Daniel, uh, I, I know this person's a false teacher. Uh, they're in my false teacher box, after all. Now, now, what do I do with them? They're a false teacher. Now what? You know, I've got some dry wood, some matches. I mean, what do we do with these, these false teachers, metaphorically? Um, or, or maybe uh, I, I see them on a, I see someone reference them on a Facebook post, and so do I need to like comment really like using all capital letters? I mean, what do I, what do, I do here? I see someone reading a book by a false teacher. Should I grab it out of their hands and, and throw it away and say, false teacher? I mean, what do I do with, uh, with false teachers? And, and how, do I, how do I confront that? What do I do with that reality? And it's, 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 those are fair questions, right? 
And I understand the desire for, for specifics and concrete application. Sometimes I think our temptation is, for some of us, it, it's to be way too broad in our definition of false teachers. A person says something that we disagree with, and we think, well, that person's a false teacher. They, they disagree with me about the beginning of time, or they disagree with me about end times, or they disagree with me about how the church should be structured. They disagree with me about spiritual gifts, so I, I think they're a false teacher. And so we are way too quick to throw the label false teacher on someone who's, who's simply, well, if they're disagreeing with me, they're just wrong, not necessarily a false teacher. One of us is wrong, but that doesn't mean that, that either of us are necessarily false teachers, but we're, we're too quick with that. And sometimes uh, some of us are, are way too slow to label something as, as false teaching or someone as a false teacher. I think I shared this as we were going through First John, but I was uh, having coffee with a person, and this person was telling me, you know, the church I go to, actually the church I'm on staff at, we, we get a, a bad rap sometimes. And I said, well, um, that's because you're teaching false things and you're false teachers. Um, which, there's really no gentle way to say that, apparently. And I said, you know, I think the bad reputation is very well deserved. And uh, I love you, but, you know, I th- here's scripture. So, well, that person said, well, you know, I, would, I don't know if I'd ever call someone a, a false teacher. There's no one I can think of that would necessarily definitely fall into that category of false teaching, which that's concerning, right? So what do we do? What do we do with that? I think as we, we look at Scripture, we see that Scripture is a, a very, a very clear teaching on false teachers. And, and constantly in Scripture, we see this, this call for you and I to be aware that false teachers exist and we, we need to be aware of that. So, for example, Jesus would say that in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. He would say, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Paul, in Acts chapter 20, as he's talking to the elders from Ephesus, he would say in Acts 20, verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. He would say in 2 Corinthians to the church in Corinth, verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 13, he talked about men who are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Paul would tell his young pastor friend Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.1, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devo- devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and the teaching of demons. John, as we looked at in 1 John chapter 4, do not believe every spirit, beloved, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many pa- false prophets have gone out into the world. So what we see in Scripture is that it is an important thing to, to think about false teachers. And if I was going to, to, to pick what I was going to talk on this morning, it would probably not be false teachers. You give me 10 topics, and if false teaching was one of those 10 topics, that would probably be like the 10th thing I'd, I'd just pick to talk about. It's not a pleasant thing to talk about. It's not a very uh, endearing thing to some people for you to talk about false teachers. You're not going to make yourself very popular talking about that. And yet, what do we find? We find that God's Word consistently calls us to think about false teachers and to be aware of them, for the church to to be aware that false teaching exists, and we need to know what the characteristics of false teaching are and know how to respond to those. And so as someone whose conscience is held held captive by the Word of God, whose job is to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God, uh, if God allows me to continue in this many years, I'm going to continue to talk about false teaching because it comes up again and again in Scripture. Why is that? Why does, why does God call us to think about something that, that seems so negative? And the reason is because false teachers and false teaching represent such a danger to our church and the people in our church. 
false teaching, believing the wrong things about who God is, believing the wrong things about how God wants us to live is, is a real danger. Bethany Community Church is not immune to the danger of false teachers. You and the people that you love, the people that are part of this community of faith, the enemy is going to try to influence, to believe wrong things about God, wrong things about sin, wrong things about how you should live, wrong things about how you should be in relationship with God. And we must be prepared for that reality. So, with that in mind, kind of the main thing that I want you to see as we look at these verses in 2 John, the main thing I want you to grasp is, is those who are going to love in truth must love the truth. So 2 John and 1 John have all been about fellowship, about being part of this community of faith, and we see that we're to love one another, we're to, to be in relationship with God and relationship with one another. And if we are going to, to love in truth, like truly love each other, we have to love the truth. And part of loving the truth means confronting those who seek to destroy the truth, who seek to destroy our ability to be in true relationship with one another. We have to know how to deal with false teaching and false teachers. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Three questions and answers I want us to consider. Here's the first question. Question number one, what is a false teacher? Three questions to help us understand false teachers and how to respond to them. Number one, what is a false teacher? Look at verse seven. It tells us. We'll look at the answer here and then kind of consider some other things that scripture tells us. Verse seven. He says, uh, for many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the Antichrist. So there's a couple things that I, I want you to see about false teachers here just in this verse first. And uh, one thing we see about false teachers is false teachers are spreading a message. He says there's, there's many of these people. And he says these, these numerous people have gone out into the world. And whenever John uses this expression, gone out into the world, it's never in a positive sense as he's talking about teachers. So, for example, he says it here, they've, they've gone out in the world. Uh, 1 John 2.19, he says, they went out from us. They weren't of us. If they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. And he's talking there about the church that's underneath the teaching of the apostles. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, he says, we looked at this already, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have what? They've gone out into the world. What John is describing here is he's saying, okay, here's the head of the church, Jesus Christ, and then here's the, the teaching of the apostles and, and the prophets, and so there, there's that. And then the, the true church places itself underneath the teaching of the apostles and prophets, and these people are, are outside of us. Here's the biblical church that submits itself to the word of God. Now, here are these other teachers, and these other teachers are separate from the church. Those of us uh, who listen to teachers, who speak at conferences or, or write books, who aren't part of the local church, that should be like a huge warning flag. You know? Whenever Rob Bell left the local church, that surprised me not at all. Whenever Donald Miller says, I don't really go to church, I just try to influence people and write books, that, that's a huge red flag, right? Whenever we find ourselves outside the church, we find ourselves outside the means by which God has called his people to live how community is supposed to exist. So false teachers are, are outside, their, false teachers are spreading their message and it's a message that's outside the context of the church. A second thing we see about false teachers from this passage, false teachers spread, th this isn't a very like deep point here, just caveat it. Uh, false teachers spread a false message, okay? What does he say? He says, they've gone out in the world, and they are those who do not confess, and that word confess means to declare or to, to, to state agreement with, to admit something to be true. These are false teachers who do not confess, declare the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. So what are they denying there? 
they're denying the, the full humanity of Jesus Christ. And, and John uses the present tense there, like Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. So, so right now, the fact that Jesus Christ was fully God and became a man, that, that truth is still a present truth. Jesus Christ is still fully God and fully man, and it influences how we believe we come into relationship with God. It affects the gospel. As we went through 1 John, we saw that sometimes John would use just little, little parts of, of a description of who Jesus was to describe all of the teaching about Jesus. So we talk about people needing to confess that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. He would talk about people needing to confess that Jesus was the Son of God, that he had come in the flesh. And so he'd use these little phrases to describe the full teaching about Jesus Christ, that he is fully God, fully man, the one who came as the Messiah. False teachers spread a false message that attacks the truth of the gospel. This truth that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, fully God, fully man, is, is essential for us to rightly understand why he came. Hebrews chapter 1 would affirm the deity of Jesus Describing Jesus, it says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And Hebrews 2 would talk about his humanity and the necessity of us understanding the full humanity of Jesus. Verse 14 of Hebrews 2, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. Verse 17, He made him to be like his brothers in every respect, that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God. Then here it is to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You see, it is absolutely necessary that we rightly understand who Jesus is. This is, what, this is what John is telling us through 1 John and 2 John. It is absolutely essential that we fully understand who Jesus Christ is, at least these essential truths about who Jesus Christ is, so that our sins can be forgiven. Listen to what John would say in 1 John as he describes who Jesus is. He says in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, Jesus is the propitiation, the complete satisfaction for our sins. 1 John 3, verse 5, you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation, that is, the complete satisfaction for our sins. What is John saying? For a person to deny the humanity of Jesus Christ means they are denying who he is and they are endangering a person's ability who listens to their teaching to have their sins dealt with and to come into relationship with God and relationship with other believers. A false teacher is one who teaches a message that undermines the truth of the gospel. What is the gospel? What is the good news that we have to know? We need to know that we are sinners. And we need to know that the penalty for sin is eternal separation from God. We must know that our sin separates us from being in relationship with God and relationship with one another through God. We have to know that and believe that. We need to know that Jesus Christ was fully God, therefore he can save and he can be perfect. And we need to know that he was fully man, therefore he died in our place. And we need to know the means by which we receive God's forgiveness through his son Jesus Christ is not on the basis of our own works, but by placing our faith in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, by trusting him alone. We, we have to know those things. We have to believe in Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice, as the Son of God, as fully man. We must trust in him for our salvation. And if a teacher comes along 
and distorts any aspect of that truth, the reality of sin or the punishment of, of sin or who Jesus Christ is in dealing with sin or how we receive forgiveness by placing our faith in Jesus Christ alone apart from our works. If a teacher comes along and distorts any aspect of that message, that teacher is a false teacher. And furthermore, I want to show you a couple other verses. What we see and what we've seen in 1 John, and John is so passionate about this, once you place your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, the gospel bears fruit in your life, and you live in obedience to this truth that you've believed. And if a person denies these truths or denies how a person is to live in light of the gospel, that person's a false teacher. In fact, uh, keep your finger there and second, you know, you probably don't even need to. It's like next page. Look at, look at uh, Jude. You skip 3 John, go over to Jude. And listen to some other things we see about false teachers. False teachers also are those who promote immorality. Verse 4 of Jude. He says, these are ungodly people. Because I was going to write to you, this is verse 3, I was going to write to you about our common salvation, but instead I had to write to you to, to appeal, to contend for the faith. Verse 4, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. So what are these people? Not only are they denying the gospel, but the life that we're to live in light of the gospel, we rightly say there's God, God is gracious to us. We live in grace, but they, they, they pervert that grace and say you can live in, in sensuality and immorality. They deny the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. It's a false teacher. So a false teacher not only teaches wrong things, they, they teach about who Jesus is. They teach wrong ways to live. We see other things about the, the morality of these false teachers. They lack humility. We kind of see this in verses 8 through 11. They lack humility in their interaction with the spiritual world. We see that they're motivated by, by greed. It says in verse 11 of Jude, they, they've abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error. They've per, the, the same type of people who perish in Korah's rebellion. They're, verse 12, they're hidden reefs at your love feast. So, so these are, are men and women who are engaged in ministry, not because they're motivated by the glory of God, but they're motivated by this, this insatiable appetite for physical things. They want the, the delights, the, the material wealth that this world offers, and so they're engaged in ministry by these, by these wicked motives, for these wicked motives. Selfish gain. They, they come, they're, the, they're like the first people that are in line at the, the buffet at your love feasts, and they're just kind of gorging themselves on the things of the church. They're an effective and truly satisfying spiritual hunger. He says they're like shepherds feeding themselves. They're waterless clouds. They're swept along by winds. They're fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. You come to them for spiritual nourishment and you receive nothing. These people, these people are also divisive. Verse 16, these are grumblers, malcontents, Following their own sinful desires, their loudmouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage. Second Peter talks about their division, divisiveness as well. So, what are false teachers? What are false teachers? False teachers are men and women who teach things about the character of God that distort the gospel message. A false teacher teaches things about who Jesus Christ is and about how we can be in relationship with God that, that distorts the gospel message and endangers the souls of people. There are also people who are motivated by sinful desires to engage in ministry and whose conduct reveals the state of their heart and not only do they believe and do wrong things, they teach others to believe and do wrong things. They believe wrong things, they do wrong things, they teach others to believe and do wrong things. Now notice, very interesting, after first service, someone kind of talked to me about a false teacher and 
he was talking about, about Benny Hinn. He said, you know, here's some things about Benny Hinn. And he goes, yeah, at the same time, I have to acknowledge that, that God has done some things through Benny Hinn. Notice that one of the characteristics of a, false te- of a true teacher isn't, well, has God used them in some way? <laughs> no. Notice another sign isn't, well, have, have success, do they have worldly success? Are there lots of numbers? That's not the criteria by which you judge someone as a true or false teacher. The criteria you judge them by is whether or not they're faithful to the gospel in both the teaching of it and the application of it. And, Notice this as well. We're not talking about people that we just disagree with, even over serious things. I can remember I was at a, a conference as a youth sponsor one time, and, and uh, I, you know, I kind of grew up in a, um, a very a much more conservative church, and you know, very, um, that, the, the application of our conservative nature wasn't just in doctrine, but, but maybe in some other practices as well. I, I think that if, uh, if anyone had ever raised a hand during worship at a church, you probably would have sprained something like, you know, oh, that doesn't feel quite right. Um, you know, just very, you know, stoic right? in, in some ways. So I was at this conference, and that's kind of what I'm used to, and, and uh, all of a sudden, during the worship time, the youth are there, then uh, there's, I mean, there's some people really getting into it, I and mean, some hand raising, and some shouting, and, you know, just some people dancing around the aisles, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm calling up the senior pastor, Hey, I think we brought the kids to a conference of the devil, you know. So we'll describe what's happening. People are singing really loudly. Daniel, you need to calm down. <laughs> Take a step back, deep breath. Okay. Yeah, you may disagree with some things doctrinally with, with, with some of the people at this conference, but that doesn't make them false teachers. We can disagree over a lot of things. We can disagree about the nature of of women in ministry. We can disagree about uh, how a church should be governed. We can disagree about end times. There's a lot of things that are, are, and I'm not minimizing the importance of these things. These These are very serious things. And by the way, we're culpable to God on how we live in light of all the truth in Scripture. And yet, these things aren't the gospel. They don't affect how we live in light of the gospel. A false teacher, a false teacher here is a person who is denying the gospel by both their life and their doctrine. And the very strange thing to me is that oftentimes the people that we are upset at are not the people who are the false teachers, but those who call out the false teachers. Think of uh, Shai Lin, who wrote a song, sang a song called False Teachers, and began listing the names. You know. Joyce Meyer you mentioned uh, you know, the Benny Hens, and you know, just kind of went through T.D. Jakes, those guys. And he, he's, Shai Lin became the bad guy. False teachers. False teachers are those, through their life and their teaching, deny the gospel and we need, we need to be aware that they exist. Okay, so all right, uh, here's the second question. Here's the second question. Why are false teachers so dangerous? Why are false teachers so dangerous? Look at verses 8 and 9. Listen to what John tells us. He says, watch yourselves. And, and by the way, remember, I, as I mentioned last week, John is a gentle guy. In 1 John, there's only 10 times that he gives us like a direct imperative, an instruction. Uh, remember last week, he kind of couched his instruction in terms of a request. Hey, hey I'm asking that you, you've done this, now do this. And this is one of the, the two times in 2 John that he gives a direct imperative. So it's, it's pretty important to pay attention. This is a big deal to John. He says, watch yourselves. It's an instruction. Not, hey, I'm asking you to watch yourself. No, watch yourselves. He says, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. And then he says in verse 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, verse 8 I think describes the first danger that a false teacher represents. A false teacher can represent a danger to a genuine believer, and I I think that's what's happening in verse 8. In verse 8, he's saying, okay, 
those of us who have trusted in Jesus Christ, who have believed the, the right things about the gospel, there's a danger that engaging or allowing false teaching to exist in our, our community, there's a danger that that represents. The danger is that the things that we have worked for can be undermined if we're not vigilant in watching and guarding against false teachers. You say, well, what is the, what exactly is he talking about? When he says the, the, the work that we've done can be undermined, well, what does Jesus say that the work that we're to do is? John chapter 6, people ask Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God. And Jesus says in verse 29 of John 6, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. What is the essence of the work that the believer does? By the, the essence of the work that we do is believe in Jesus. Whenever Jesus says something, we do that. We place our complete confidence in him for our salvation. And John says, for those of you who are believers, who are working to have a community of faith that loves and honors God and is in relationship with one another, the danger for you is that if you allow false teaching and aren't vigilant in defending against false teaching, that the things you've worked for, God being glorified through faith, could be undermined. It's a real danger. What else is the danger? Well, verse 9, verse 9, I think, describes the danger to a person who isn't a believer. Verse 9 he says, everyone who goes on ahead, and that phrase, goes on ahead, I think is kind of like this subtle dig that John gives against these false teachers. These false teachers believe that their, their teaching was more advanced, that it had gone beyond the, the teaching of the apostles. And he says, those of you who are running on ahead, you've got this, this, this message that is, a, quote unquote, beyond us, but really is less than us because it says they don't bring this teaching. They've gone on ahead, but they've left the teaching behind. It says, and they don't abide the teaching of Christ. It says this person does not have God. The danger that exists even at Bethany Community Church, if we're not vigilant in guarding the truth and saying this is the right truth about who Jesus is and how he desires us to live. The danger is that those that we love could not receive eternal life, could not receive a relationship with God because they wouldn't trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation. These false teachers teach something wrong about Jesus Christ and who he is. They teach something wrong about how to live. They teach something wrong about how to come into relationship with God. They undermine sin. They say, you don't need to worry about sin. It won't affect your relationship with God. You can live how you want. And these people, the message that they teach, the people who believe it, don't understand their need for a Savior and the fact that Jesus Christ is fully God, fully man, has dealt with sin, and they must place their faith in him. They never believe that. They don't abide in God. They don't have a relationship with him. It affects their eternal destiny. This isn't a, a light thing. The teaching of universalism that, that anyone can be saved apart from knowing Jesus Christ is a message that is that is completely contradictory to, to Scripture. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 16.31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. 1 Timothy 2.5, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There is one way to God, and you and I, who are part of the church, who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, must be passionate about unwaver and be unwavering in our commitment to communicate that gospel message to those that we love in this church. There is one way to God, and that one way to God is through his son, Jesus Christ. We cannot waver in that. And false teaching represents the greatest danger to a person coming to eternal life a person who stays within the context of the church, but in a church that's not preaching the true gospel. Jesus, see that no one leads you astray. Watch out. Beware of the scribes. See that no one leads you astray. Be on guard. Over and over again, Jesus warns us about this. Paul, Paul, take care. 
I'm sorry, the writer of Hebrews, take care, watch out. You say, okay, you know what? So false teacher is, is, is this, and a false teacher undermines the truth of the gospel and, and both the, the doctrine and, and lifestyle, and they're dangerous. They represent a loss of reward to the believer. And by the way, loss of reward there, I think what he's talking about for the believers is not you're going to miss out on heaven in, in terms of you could have gotten in heaven and now you can't. But what, what I think loss of reward means there is when, a, when Scripture describes the loss of reward, it's saying, okay, the believer through disobedience, has lost some of their ability to enjoy the fullness of God's presence and glory in eternity. A believer whose obedience expands their, their capacity to enjoy heaven for eternity, a believer who enters heaven and, and has been disobedient to God has, has lost opportunity to experience the, the fullness of God. And it doesn't mean that a person who's a believer is going to enter heaven if there's, if, if there's been disobedience and say, well, man, heaven just doesn't seem that great. There's going to be a loss. There's going to be a sense of I'm not experiencing the fullness of God that I could have through obedience and reward. So here's the third question then. How, how do we respond to false teachers? I recognize that false teachers represent this danger to me. They represent a danger to those I love. How do I respond? And here's what John says. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. And here's the scenario that I think John is describing. A person has come into this community, and as they come into the community, they, they purport to be a teacher. And as they're in this, this first century culture, as the church hears this person come and they find that this person doesn't believe the right things about who Jesus is, this church is instructed by John not to give them the opportunity to influence others. So, for example, he says, don't, don't receive him in your house. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean don't have him over for a meal. What it means is, is don't say, hey, uh, you're kind of this, this itinerant preacher. Why don't you come and you can stay at my house and I'll feed you and I'll give you kind of the things that you need to, to do your ministry. You can stay here while you're here teaching. John says, uh, look, don't do that. And the next thing he says, it seems a little bit harsh. He says, and, and also uh, don't, don't give him any greeting. And you say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean if I'm like walking down the street and uh, there's false teacher, I just kind of like avert my eyes and kind of walk like this? Is, or he kind of holds out his hand and I go like this? I mean, what, what do I do? Is that, how, is that what John means? No, what John is saying here is the greeting in the first century would have been like, uh, it would have been a greeting in the church that implied brotherhood and, and sisterhood, part of the common faith. So a person might say greetings and then John, uh, Paul says this in, in 1 Corinthians, I think. He says, a greetings to you in the, in the name of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. As you give a greeting, you're saying we're part of this same community of faith. And John says, look, you can't do that. You can't let a person come into your home and support them in this ministry that's undermining the gospel that you're trying to proclaim. And furthermore, if a person comes and teaches things that are contrary to the gospel or contrary about how to live according to the gospel, you can't say, hey, brother, hey, sister. This sounds really harsh, but it's absolutely essential for us to understand. And we, we can't understand this response that John encourages us to give unless we acknowledge the danger, right? If we've acknowledged the reality of the danger, it helps us understand the seriousness of the response to the serious danger, right? Whenever I was uh, a boy, my dad uh, sometimes would look at me and maybe I'd been disrespectful to my mom and he'd, say, he'd look at me and say, son, kind of like that, son, You can't treat your mother that way. Yes, sir. Son, 
you're like, a, you're like an offense, offensive lineman. Your job is to protect the quarterback. Son, you're tackling your own quarterback. You can't do that. You know that expression on his face like, I hope I'm not raising a fool. <laughs> the same is, is true here. John is saying, look, you, you can't tackle your own quarterback. You, you're trying to establish th- this church built upon faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and you're tearing that down with your own hands. A, a person who supports a person teaching a gospel contrary to the gospel that I've taught you, John is saying, is participating, currently participating in those work, wicked works. He said, well, then what do I do? What do I do? Let, let me give you some principles for application. There, there's, there's about eight of these that as I was kind of thinking through that I think help us res, respond rightly to false teachers. Number one, I think we have a responsibility to, to guard the truth. Guard the truth. Love it. Learn it. Protect it. Teach it. Paul would tell Timothy, Timothy, oh Timothy, he would say in 1 Timothy 6.20, guard the deposit trusted to you, entrusted to you. He'd tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. He'd tell Timothy in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it. He'd tell the church in 2 Thessalonians, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our, by our letter. And I love Ezra 7.10. Ezra 7.10 is one of my favorite passages, and, and all who are in a, a teaching position, I, I think, should which is all of us in here, should, should really learn Ezra 7.10. Ezra, it says in Ezra 7.10, listen to the, the process he went through. It says he had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. So Ezra studied the law of the Lord. He knew it. Then what happened? It says, then he had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and then to do it, so to personally apply it. And then what? And then to teach it, to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So Ezra had set his heart to study the law, then to do it, and then to teach it. Not teach it, then do it, then learn it. So how do we confront false teaching? Well, I think the first thing that we have to do is say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guard the truth. I'm going to love the truth. I'm going to study the truth. I'm going to apply the truth. Then I'm going to teach it to others. So I guard the truth. I, I love it. I have the passion. I see the value of truth. Then secondly, another thing that I encourage you with is you, you protect yourself and others from bad teaching. Now, you have to be careful here because it's hard sometimes to say, okay, well, uh, here's this resource that I have, and, and the resource isn't like the worst resource in the world, but it's also not the best, what I do there. And I say, you know, I, it's hard sometimes to draw a clear, hard and fast line, but, but I would just, my general practice personally is this. My time is limited, right? And the things that I am going to allow to influence me are, I'm going to try to find the best stuff, the best resources. And certainly as a church, there are a lot of good resources that we could promote. But what we try to do as a church anyway is is find, in terms of what we're going to promote to the widest possible audience, we're going to try to promote the best stuff. That doesn't mean even the best stuff doesn't have some things we disagree with, but we have to protect ourselves and others from bad teaching. Titus 1.9 Elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So we protect ourselves and others from, from bad teaching. Uh, we find a, a person who's in a relationship with us and they say, hey, I'm, I'm reading this material, and we, we know that that material has some, some things that undermine the true gospel. Someone uh, in between the services said, hey, I have this friend who just, they're a believer and they have done amazing things in my life, but um, they really sometimes love Benny Hinn. What do I do with Benny Hinn? Benny Hinn's a guy who, 
who denies the gospel in some, some very key areas and is certainly motivated by some things that are completely contradictory to what God tells us a pastor is to be motivated. He said, now how do I, how do I interact with this friend? I said, well, I, what have you done? He said, well, I've, I've told him here's why I think it's wrong. I said, you know, I think that's, that's the right thing to do. We protect ourselves in terms of, of talking and, and others we, in terms of talking about, hey, that's, here's why that's bad. Now, does that mean any person who believes, uh, who uh, appreciates a false teacher isn't really a believer? No, no, but I think it's right for us to, to say, hey, brother, I love you, and I think that that, that concerns me that, that you're drawn to that. A third thing that I'd encourage you with is, is to not deal in hearsay. You know? Well, I've heard that so-and-so is kind of a false teacher. Well, what have you heard about him? I, I just I think I saw a Facebook blurb on them, and I'm pretty concerned about it. You know, don't deal in hearsay. Paul tells Timothy, don't accept an accusation against an elder except on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And I, I certainly have personally uh, been the recipient of people believing wrong things about what I said on the basis of hearsay. And so it's not a right way, not a right way to, to determine if someone's a false teacher. Uh, fourth thing I'd encourage a person to do is to confront directly and lovingly when possible. It's interesting, John says here, he says, if anyone comes to you, in other words, uh, this person's coming to your sphere of influence, I don't think it's my responsibility to confront every false teaching and every false teacher who exists in the world. I don't think it's even my responsibility to confront every false teacher who exists in central Illinois. It's just, just not, I don't have the time, and, and certainly they're not in my sphere of influence, but what I think happens is whenever a person who's teaching something false comes into our sphere of influence, God gives us the opportunity, there should be a, hey, a loving confrontation. Say, this is, this is what I hear you saying, and here's what God's word says, and are, are you really saying something that's, that, that's in contradiction to, to the gospel? And sometimes, sometimes I think God's very gracious in those situations as we are able to instruct the person why what they're teaching is, is false. And of course, I think this is important too, not every person who teaches false things, even very, very serious false things, is, is necessarily a false teacher. They can also be un uninformed. And it's interesting to see how the Spirit of God works in the heart of a person who's untrained and maybe has been teaching some things, but they're a believer. And so you say, hey, here's why what you're seeing, here's how, here's how what you're teaching undermines the gospel and how they respond in a neat way to that. It happens a lot. Number five, uh, I'd encourage a person to refuse to subject themselves to a false teacher. I was on a mission trip one time and was talking to a, a young man who was just on fire for the Lord. Just some neat things were on his life, and yet he was in a church that, that completely undermined the gospel. And I said, you know what? Um, you, you need to leave. You're subjecting yourselves to, yourself to some false teachers. Uh, number six, uh, refuse to call false teachers believers. Refuse to give false teachers a platform for ministry. Here's where it becomes very difficult for those of us who want to seriously apply verse 10 here. What this means is sometimes we have to say some very offensive things to people who are undermining the gospel. There have been times where I've, I've been at a, an event and there's been a call, hey, why don't we all pray together as brothers and sisters in Christ? And I've had to say, hey, I, I love these people, but we believe different things about the gospel. This person believes something different than I do about Jesus Christ and who he is. Or this person believes something different about how a person come, can come into relationship with, with Jesus Christ. And in fact, I love you enough to say, if you're relying upon your own works to be found acceptable to God, you're in real, real danger and there's a possibility you're, you're not in a relationship with God and, and you need to understand who Jesus Christ is, how he completely dealt, he's complete satisfaction for our sins. And if you don't believe that about Jesus Christ and you don't believe it's faith alone that saves you, you're not in a relationship with God. There are people who've given platforms in evangelical churches to, to, to people who are, who are heretics. I mentioned this, uh, I 
didn't mention this in first service. Um, you know, there, there are people who have given platforms to heretics in their churches. There are people who have uh, allowed uh, people who are uh, Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses to come into their church and greet them as brothers and sisters in Christ and allow them to have the pulpit to share things and, and, and can't do that. It's not because we don't love people. It's not because we don't love those who are in disobedience to the to the gospel, it's because we love the gospel. We love God, and because we love them, we want them to be in a relationship with God, and they can't do that through believing wrong things about Jesus. Number seven, you have to be careful here too, but you have to expose their deeds to others at times. Now again, my job isn't to stand up here and say, okay, uh, I have about eight different heresies we're going to cover this morning, and here they are, and here are the people who did them, and, and uh, here's their mailing address. You can write to them. That's not, my, that's not my job. But as I come to God's Word, and I teach what God's Word says, and I, I find false teaching, and I find it affecting the church, I've got to confront it. So when the emergent church begins to influence the way that we think about church and about the nature of God. I've got to talk about that. Whenever postmodern thinking begins affecting how we view knowledge and our, our epistemology, I've got, I've got to address those things. And you say, well, Daniel, is it, is it wrong to ever talk about a false teacher if you haven't gone to them first? Like, do you have to do kind of Matthew 18 with every false teacher? And I think the answer is no. Um, we, we see in Scripture that a teacher is held to a higher standard. And so if a teacher says something publicly, there's a responsibility at times, if it begins to affect your church, to confront it publicly. And I mentioned this when we went through First John, but, but some, there's kind of a spectrum here, too. I think it's helpful to think about this. There are sometimes just good teachers who teach wrong things. In fact, there's no teacher who doesn't sometimes teach wrong things. And so we, those people clearly aren't false teachers. And there are also some people who are um, they, they seem like false teachers, but, but I haven't spent enough time to really kind of know their theology and, and be confident, so I never would call them a false teacher. And then there are some people who I'm like, I'm confident that they're false teachers, but to call them a false teacher would just be, man, you'd have to like spend an hour unpacking them. Here's why, and it'd just be like throwing a hand grenade. Uh, and, you know, I don't throw hand grenades in church. I try not to, right? And then there are some people who are just like clearly off the deep end. That's, that's kind of the other end of the spectrum. And sometimes people move from that third category, that fourth category, very quickly in their ministries, and that certainly happens. Expose their deeds to others. Why? Not because there's this desire to, to shame a person publicly or because you want to kind of show how right you are and how wrong they are, but because you want people to be in a relationship with God. That's what John wants. And because you want people to be in relationship with God, you know they need to believe the right things about who Jesus is and how they can come into relationship with God. That's your driving motivation, that God would be glorified as people rightly recognize him as the only way by which they can be saved. And as they exalt his name, as he's called them to exalt their name, exalt his name in their lives. That's our passion here. That's why we mention false teachers. And then the final thing that I encourage a person with is, you know, uh, as, you, as you confront false teaching, uh, don't get in arguments. I think you need to say things, but, but if someone just wants to argue with you, it's, it's not a profitable thing. And there are, there are many people who, as I talk with them, sometimes they're just, they just want to, just kind of want to get into this argument about different things. And Paul tells Timothy, they have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies you know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. There's contentious people that just want to argue. And I think even though you're called to confront false teaching, to guard the truth, you're not called to be an argumenter, an argumentative person. Now, here are the last two verses in Second John. I want to tie them to what we've been talking about here. But here's how John concludes his epistle. He says, Though I have much to write to you, 
Uh, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Now, why has John, he had limited space, why has he written what he has written? Why did he write all this about false teaching, about the truth and love and how false teachers represent a threat to truth and love in these relationships? He wrote this, he wrote what he wrote, because he loves these people, he loves this church, and he desires for them to be in relationship with God and relationship with one another. He says, I'm looking forward to seeing you again so that our joy can be complete. And how can that joy be complete? By everyone being in relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. John's motivation in writing what he writes is that God would be exalted through the relationship that exists in a community of faith that is passionate about the truth of who Jesus Christ is and living in love. And brothers and sisters, I hope that's what you're passionate about too. I hope that there is a burning passion and desire within your heart For God to be glorified in our church as we love his truth and love his son Jesus Christ and then live as he's called us to live by faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we know that those who love in truth love the truth. And we pray that you would help us to love your truth more, to passionately proclaim it to each other, to passionately proclaim it to you be unswavering in our commitment to it. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.